praise, length, and so on, which species was indeed singing. I'm eternally grateful to him for these ordeals. I used to pour over my father's set of the classic Witherby's birds, Hope of the birds, um, the British birds, and here's the plate showing the black caps and the garden warblers. And for young people starting birding in England, uh, there was another useful species pair, the two philosophers warblers, the willow warbler and the common chiff chaff, which unlike the garden warbler and the black cap had very different songs, but looked very similar. Indeed, in the 1960s, it was quite acceptable to give up on the challenge and call what one had seen simply a willow chiff. Not so for my father. So we had to study carefully the fleeting glimpses we got of these birds to try to sort them out. And then on holiday, on my maternal grandparent's farm in Germany, Dad presented me with another species pair, this time Acrocephalus, the reed warbler and marsh warbler. Now the key thing about this process of learning was to ident about identifying warblers was getting to know familiar species very well and focusing on critical characteristics. Now as my birding progressed, like many, I would travel further afield to look for birds I've not seen before, and also spend places in the time in places where the chances of seeing unusual birds would be good. And thus, as a student, my autumn weekends would invariably be on the east coast of England, therefore adding another twist to this love affair. 45% of old world warblers are migratory, and with philosophers this is 55%, many travelling thousands of kilometres annually. The common chiff chats and willow warblers that I was watching as a novice birder in my childhood would have spent winters in very different places, the chip chats around the Mediterranean basin, the willow warblers in tropical Africa. But on the east coast of England on those autumn weekends, we were looking for vagrants of Asian origin, with the thrill of perhaps watching two palaces leaf warblers feeding in the same tree having just made landfall. Tiny birds weighing just between five to eight grams which instead of heading to northern Indochina from their southern Siberian breeding grounds were, had ended up in Western Europe, perhaps 7,000 kilometres off course. Not only was it remarkable to see such species so far from their usual range, the bird itself was extraordinarily beautiful. There was nothing quite like it in the British avifauna with its head stripes, its wing bars, and its yellow rump. And absolutely enthralling to watch as it hovered to collect tiny insects around the foliage. And so certain species became targets, and probably like every bird or in idle moments, flicking through the bird book, certain species stood out and one longed to see them. And thus for many birders, it became a necessary pilgrimage to travel east to Asia, lured perhaps above all by warblers. For me, I had to wait until my early 40s when we moved to live in India and thus developed at a mature stage further my love affair with warblers. To watch blind reed warblers and huge warblers in my garden in Delhi was something I never became bored of or took for granted. These were birds of my dreams, as was the thrill of finding the thrill of finding my first Brooks's leaf warbler at Sultanpur. Now for several years I carried out research on birds and it was no surprise that much of that was focused on warblers. Warblers have indeed provided a disproportionately large contribution to our thinking and knowledge about many of the cutting edge areas of ornithology. Taxonomy, systematics, community ecology, behavioural ecology, migration and mating systems. What I want to focus on in this talk is uh, three subfamilies, the Acrocephalines, the Sylvia and the Philoscopines, and I will introduce some of the typical species briefly of these groups here in North India, and then explore some of the fascinating results that various studies have taken 
that have taken place over the years on warblers have contributed to wider ornithology. And hopefully, thinking about warblers in this way will make us look at them with renewed interest and curiosity. And those of a more gentle disposition, I do want to warn you in advance that my talk will include reference to deceit, cheating and unfaithfulness. Now warblers can be frustratingly difficult to get good views of. Not because they're particularly shy, but because they are active little birds, constantly on the move through rather dense vegetation. And the golden rule is to keep still and be patient. The warbler will pop in and out of you. And over time, you'll get a collection of glimpses uh, which will enable you to piece together the impression of the key characters. Particularly important will be bill color, especially the lower mandible, leg color, head markings, wing markings, rump color, and of secondary importance for most birds of plumage tones, bearing in mind that those are affected a lot by the viewing conditions, the uh, age of the plumage, and the, and the age of the bird. And then behavioral traits are also important, such as hovering or wing flicking, and also any call notes. Now the Ectrocephalines are a good representation in North India and are mainly passage migrants or winter visitors. And the three species that I want to, uh, that will be most familiar, will provide good benchmarks for identification of other members of the group. Blind reed warblers uh, are mainly passage migrants in North India, a few do over winter, and they occur in a wide range of habitats, especially small bushes, uh, damp scrub, and I remember listening to one in almost full song in an ornamental baboo, uh, bamboo in my, my garden in, in Delhi in early April one year. It's a rather plain, cold, brownish plumage bird with a very short supercilium, which bulges a little bit in front of the eye, and the lower mandible is pale, and the legs tend to be darker than that of the paddy field warbler, which is also mainly a passage bird, and it will be associated more with rank vegetation in wetter areas. They have much bolder supercilia, extending well beyond the eye, and uh, often show a little bit of dark trimming around the supercilia. The plumage will be warmer than that of a blithe reed warbler, uh, with a warmer brownish tone on the rump and dark centres to the tertials and the closed wing. Uh, the pale lower mandible often has a distinct darkish tip. Now once you've got these two species logged, then that will help greatly in helping to pick up uh, less familiar and less common species in North India. Confusion species is the Sykes warbler and to some extent as well the booted warbler which have been, uh, which used to be considered to be conspecific. They have rather pale washed out plumage um, and quite pale uh, lower mandibles. Uh, they tend to be feeding and active more out in the open than the blind reed and the paddy field. And the key thing to look out for uh, with, the, with these warblers uh, is the tail which will often show paler sides and be more square ended. The black browed uh, reed warbler, uh, like the paddy field, has a long supercilium that has a distinct black line bordering the crown above the supercilium, and it's overall a rather stockier, more compact looking bird. Now, the other benchmark species that uh, you would be familiar with uh, is the resident clamorous reed warbler, which is almost as big as a babbler, slightly deeper bill, short supercilium with rather darkish laws and it often perches well out in the open and its deep croaking song will be familiar to anyone visiting their wetland habitats. The oriental reed warbler, uh, which winters in eastern India, is almost as large as clamorous reed, uh, with a smaller bill, uh, a bolder supercilium and a shorter tail. And in fresh plumage, which they will be uh, in, in the autumn after the breeding season, they have prominent pale tips to the tail. And then another large acrocephalus uh, is the thick-billed warbler, which is as big as a clamorous reed. It's quite an unusual looking acrocephalus with a rather uh, plain looking head, a dark beady eye, rather stout bill 
uh, short wings and a longish tail, almost Babylon-like as it moves around in low vegetation. Now, these are some examples, and they all have rather unprepossessing appearance. They are the plainest, Acrocephalus is the plainest group of all of the warblers, but they have, the Acrocephalites have proved to be one of the most rewarding groups of birds to be studied in uh, developing and indeed testing some of the most modern ideas in, modern, in ornithology. And this is because of several reasons. They nest in quite simple vegetation, uh, meaning that on the breeding grounds, nests can be easily found, birds can be easily tracked and individually marked. And as a group, they show great diversity. Some of them are migratory, others are sedentary, some breed on continental landmasses, others on oceanic islands, and uh, in some study areas, there will be several species present, enabling uh, uh, um, co comparative work uh, to, be, to be carried out. Now, of all of the acrocephalus, uh, of all of the warbler groups, the song of the acrocephalines is the most diverse. And the studies of song in this group of warblers have contributed significantly to thinking around behavioural ecology. Now there are two forces that drive the evolution of song. One is the role that song has in attracting females, and the other in defending resources, usually a territory, against males. Now long-term studies of acrocephalus warblers have shown that species that are monogamous have complex songs, whilst uh, large, the uh, in species that are polygamous have simple songs. Now, in largely monogamous species, the males show high paternal investment. They provide a lot of the parental care in raising the young. And so females will want to be choosing good males. And the indicator that they seem to use is the quality of the song with more complex songs being more attractive to females. With sedge warblers, a widespread western Palearctic species, rather similar to, to a moustache warbler, for example, uh, males with large repertoires, more complex songs, pair off more quickly uh, than males with simpler songs. And laboratory experiments carried out by Clyde Catchpole have shown that females get more excited when they hear more complex songs. Now why is it that song complexity is an indicator of the quality of the male? Well, again, sedge warbler males with uh, more complex songs have been shown to be less infected with blood parasites, to have greater genetic diversity, larger territories, and provide better parental care than males with more simple songs. So song complexity seems to act as an honest signal for the females in their choosing which male to pair with. Only the best males that have matured without developmental stress can develop and afford to develop and maintain complex songs. Now, I spent three years studying marsh warblers, another Western Palearctic species, a uh, little bit similar to uh, a Blythe's reed warbler. And in this species, song complexity is achieved by a very special route. Its large repertoire size comprises wholly of mimicry of other species. It's as if it's taken a shortcut in develop instead of developing and evolving its own song. And what's more, when you listen to a marsh warbler singing, it has successfully woven together the songs and calls, not just of birds of its breeding grounds, but also birds on its migration route and on its wintering grounds in Africa. And an individual male marsh warbler, on average, in a bout of song, will imitate 70 different species, more of which will be Afrotropical, than Palearctic. And this amazing discovery was made by the extraordinary Belgian ornithologist Francois Dauset Le Maire. And today, with people continuing to study marsh warblers, the total list of species known to be imitated by marsh warblers 
is now an amazing 212 species. Now, blind three warbler, like marsh warblers, are monogamous species, and they breed in relatively insect-poor habitats. So in such places, um, the role, uh, it's very important that both members of the pair are contributing to feeding the young because of the difficulty in finding enough food. Acrocephalid uh, breeding systems uh, show much more variation than almost any other passerine group and it's largely determined by food availability. Where food is relatively hard to find or particularly small, the breeding system will be monogamous. And species that are, um, and then species which are in more productive habitats and able to catch larger prey, will sh some males will show polygamous uh, behaviour. In other words, they will mate with more than one female. And in such situations, uh, the male will usually participate in feeding the young of the first female, leaving the second or the third female to rear the young by themselves. In the case of great reed warblers, males may have, may have up to four females, but the male will be provisioning and providing parental care just to the young of the first one. Even with monogamous species like sedge warblers, there will be some males that will attempt these extra pair copulations, mating with a different female. When I was studying marsh warblers, I was also colour rigging sedge warblers, and I once found a sedge warbler male, which I knew to have a female which was incubating eggs at the time, a kilometre away from its territory, singing as if it was a brand newly arrived male. And it was what it was doing was seeking to deceive, to, to cheat, uh, to an unsuspecting newly arrived female that he was unpaired. Now, moustache warblers are socially monogamous species, and females are, are unable to raise young um, without the help of males. And it's been discovered that uh, intruding male moustache warblers will help both in the incubation and feeding of young, and therefore, in this species, there's a type of cooperative breeding. And usually these intruding male marsh, uh, moustache warblers will have a genetic stake uh, in the brood. They will have mated with that female. But the best example of cooperative breeding in acrocephalid warblers is that of the Seychelles warbler. Now this fascinating study was carried out, uh, was started by Jan Condor. And on tiny islands, the amount of available habitat was quickly saturated by warblers. Paired birds occupied and defended territory sometimes up to nine years. The breeding success uh, was low, but adults' uh, life expectancy was high, so adults were long-lived. Some offspring delay uh, their, or even forego their reproduction in order to stay on their parental territories. And female offspring, the daughters, were much more likely to stay on their parents' territories and care for the subsequent broods of their parents. And about half of these daughters had also laid an egg in the nest of their mother. And about 40% of the offspring raised uh, from the nest would not have been sired by the dominant male of the group. These resulted in matings from males from outside. So quite a complex situation. Now, having these daughters the, as helpers increased the breeding success, but this was advantageous in good territories where there was plenty of food. So in good territory, um, in territories where there was not uh, good uh, availability of food in poor territories, then what you would have would then be competition between the different helpers. You could have the breeding success falling. So in good territories, it was better to have daughters who would stay to help, and in poor territories, better to have sons who would then disperse. Now this seems to be the case. In, it was found that in good territories, 
87% of the young were daughters, and in poor territory, experimentally to a good territory, they started producing daughters. And pairs in high quality territories um, began to produce daughters if their helpers were taken away experimentally. Now, studies have shown that this sex determination occurs before ovulation, and it's thought that the, uh, a stress hormone plays a role in this. The other end of the spectrum is the amazing story of the aquatic warbler, which is a streaked acrocephalus found in wetlands in Eastern Europe. Now, in this uh, habitat, food is super abundant. And uh, many of the prey agents are large, and the aquatic warblers have got quite large bills, which enable them to capture large prey easily. Here, there is no pair bond at all. The male plays absolutely no role in uh, supporting the female. The female can find enough food and care for their young completely on their own, and the females are aggressive to one another, and they defend territories during the time they have young in the nest. The males uh, don't defend territories, they have large overlapping home ranges. Most of the broods of aquatic warblers have mixed paternity, and in some clutches they've been fertilised about to five different males. So there's a lot of competition going on between the males, or more strictly speaking, between the sperm of the males. Now, work on sperm competition has shown that when sperm competition is high, the testes of the, ma of, well, of the males will be large, and sperm production is high. Aquatic warbler males have indeed enormous testes. And what's also remarkable about the aquatic warbler is the length of the copulation itself. Now, as you know, most birds will mate in just one or two seconds. You, uh, you blink and it's over. The male and female aquatic warblers, when they are copulating, will stay together, on average, for 24 minutes. This is a painting by David Quinn. 24 minutes copulation. Now, whilst the home range of male aquatic warblers is very large, territories of other uh, uh, acrocephaluses are very much smaller. So if you look at the Blythe Reed Warbler, they'll usually have about three territories per hectare. Marsh Warblers, about eight territories per hectare. And Clamorous Reed Warblers will cluster in areas of very good habitat, where in just in one case, within 120 square metres, 26 active Clamorous Reed Warbler nests have been found. Now, I studied marsh warblers on their wintering grounds, also in southern Africa, where they also held territories. And here they undergo a full moat, molt before their northward migration. And the purpose of the territory was to defend an area to safeguard food during this critical period. And what was fascinating was the site faithfulness. Uh, almost all of the birds that survived from one year to the next returned to the same tiny little winter territory. And this gave rise to the incredible thought that these birds would have an intimate knowledge of two very small patches of structurally similar habitat, yet lying 8,000 kilometres apart. Or indeed, if you looked at the migration route taken by the birds, the actual distance apart would be 11,000 kilometres. So, despite their initial appearance of being very uniform looking of all, uh, of, all of the warblers, the acrocephalids show fascinating diversity. I've just given a few examples, and for those who are interested in more about this group, then I'd recommend a book called The Reed Warblers by Bert Leisler and Carl Schulzhagen. Now, the Sylvia Warblers are less well represented in India. There are about seven species recorded, or perhaps more depending on opinions on taxonomy of lesser white throats. Um, I'm not an expert on taxonomy or systematics, but if you follow the split, then in, in India there's the lesser and the huge uh, white throats, as well as the small white throat in the west. 
The centre of diversity of the Silvia warblers is in the Mediterranean basin. And where I live in Extremadura in the southwest of Spain, we have eight species of Silvia. And of the 14 species of warblers that I've seen in my garden, five of them are Silvia warblers. Now, the two most com uh, widespread and common wintering Silvia warblers in northern India are the lesser white throats and the Orphean warblers. Uh, the lesser white throats are best separated from each other on plumage tone, but it's difficult and uh, the jury is very much out on that. The Hume's white throat tends to be a little bit larger, slightly darker plumage than the lesser white throat. Uh, a small or desert white throat, which I haven't got a, a photograph here, is rather smaller and finer and rather more paler and washed out looking. Orphean warblers, on the other hand, are larger, thick-set warblers with stout bills, and adults will show pale irises, uh, with a rather dark crown contrasting with the, the paler mantle. Now, Sylvia warblers have contributed greatly to our knowledge of migration, with studies particularly on European black caps and garden warblers. Now, the European black cap shows great variation in migratory patterns. So there are populations which are wholly sedentary on Mediterranean islands, some which are partially partial migrants in the Mediterranean basin and Western Europe. Um, where I live in southwestern Spain, black caps breed, but they are far outnumbered in the winter by uh, migrants from Central Europe. Uh, they're particularly attractive to, attracted to fruit trees, and we're surrounded by old olive groves. And in the course of a two hour walk, I can easily find 150 or so black caps in the winter. Then there are also populations which are long distance migrants from further north and, and, and east, wintering in eastern Africa some 6,000 kilometres away. And these migrants will be migrating about 200 kilometres each night. Now, warblers are mainly nocturnal migrants, and they migrate alone, and they're not, not in flocks, and usually the adults will leave before the juveniles. So for a juvenile, migrating for the first time alone and at night would appear quite a daunting thing. So that raises many questions. When should departure take place? In which direction should the bird fly? How should, far should it fly? Where should it go to? Will it have enough energy? And Sylvia Warbers have helped answer a lot of these questions. Experiments with, um, experiments with uh, garden warblers have uh, contributed greatly to our knowledge of uh, migration orientation and, and navigation. They've shown that the birds have an annual, an internal annual clock that determines when migration starts and when it should stop. And this seems to be inherited, although it's synchronized by uh, day length. And not only is the timing of uh, migration uh, inherited, but also orientation as well. Black caps show a migratory divide, so that the black caps that breed in southern Germany show a southwestern migratory direction, and uh, those that breed in Austria migrate southeasterly. And birds in the laboratory, under laboratory conditions, have shown these migration directions in orientation cages. Hybrid black caps um, with parentage from both South Germany and Austria show an intermediate direction, which in real life would send those black caps over the Alps and across the widest part of the Mediterranean. So presumably real life hybrids would have a much lower survival rate. Some individuals um, stray from their pre-programmed orientation, they may turn up as vagrants, uh, well of course. Uh, this of course provides a lot of excitement to, for birding. Uh, look, many of these individuals will tend to be young birds uh, that may simply be getting it wrong. But it also may allow for evolutionary change. And this is what seems to be happening again with black caps. Since the 1960s, 60s, there's been an increasing number of black caps from Central Europe that have been wintering in England and Southern Ireland instead of the Mediterranean basin. And what they're finding in England is uh, 
a, a good food supply, food in, that people are putting out in gardens, and an opportunity of getting back to their breeding grounds early. What's most interesting is that over the last few decades there has been the evolution of two forms of black caps in Central Europe. Those wintering in Britain with finer bills and those wintering in the Iberian Peninsula with stouter bills that are feeding mainly on a diet of olives. Now whilst the Sylvia warblers uh, are more interestingly plumaged than the Acrocephalus, the Philoscopus are arguably the most exquisitely plumaged of all of the warblers, and they have their heartland here in Asia. They are small, rather dainty, with fine bills, rather short tails, and extremely active, flitting amongst the foliage, flicking their wings, sometimes hovering. And it's during this rapid moment that you get glimpses of plumage features that may be important for identification. In the case of Philoscopus warblers, this means looking for wing bars, or the absence of wing bars, the head pattern, the colour of the rump, any white on the tail, and so on. You're going to be lucky to get a view of all of these parts of the birds in one go. So watching leaf warblers, watching Philoscopus warblers, is a little bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle. You get a view of a wing, then a few seconds later, a view of the side of the head, and then briefly the rump as the bird hovers for a bit, and so on. So one's got to piece together all of these series of snapshots. And then finally, uh, the leaf warblers do call a lot when they forage, so it's always worth noting out a description of this call because it can be important. Now, including vagrants, there are about 20 species of Philoscopus warblers that could occur in North India. Uh, given the large number of leaf warblers in the region, I'm not going to attempt to describe each one. So what I'm going to do is to focus on just a few that have a special significance for me. The common chiffchaff is indeed a common winter visitor, and as you remember, it was one of the first identification trials that I was given to by my father. And they can be found quite easily in a big range of habitats, especially low bushes and close to water. There's in fact a wonderful similarity between North India and my home in southwest Spain. In both common chiff chaps are abundant and widespread winter visitors. And as well as searching by, uh, for insects in, by gleaning foliage and sometimes even hovering, they'll also feed on the ground, particularly in damp areas, and when um, there's, the feeding is good, you'll often get smaller groups, assemblages of chip chaps. Their behaviour and choice of habitat means it's usually possible to get very good views of this obliging bird. But sometimes it looks like little sprites as they're hovering above uh, pools of water on a winter's afternoon. And they occupy an amazing uh, array of habitats. In my home region, they occur up to 1,500 metres above sea level in winter and are found practically everywhere, from open grassland, rice paddies, woodlands, right to uh, the centre of cities. Now, the commonest warbler where we lived in India was the Hughes warbler, and it occurs in wooded areas, including parks and gardens, and its penetrating dissabilic call, which it persists, persist, uh, delivers persistently, is a characteristic sound of winter birding in that sort of habitat. They forage actively in the foliage, frequently flicking their wings, hovering much less than other species, and they do tend to um, stay in defined uh, home ranges. Now, a real speciality is the Brooks's leaf warbler. Um, there's at least one or two around the uh, uh, area here of the, of the festival. Uh, they winter mainly in the northern plains from the Punjab to Uttar Pradesh, and particularly favouring acacias. Uh, it's a very small, energetic warbler, tending to stay quite high up in the canopy. It has a distinctive single note which will help to locate it. And it forages mainly by hovering, which it tends to do almost constantly, reaching out to pick up insects from the tips of leaves. And it tends to be on its own, and individuals will occupy winter home ranges or territories. Certainly it's quite easy to relocate, relocate individuals on subsequent visits to the same batch of trees, belt of trees. Now the lemon-rumped warbler is 
common in the hill forests of the Himalayas, and it's one of my favourite birds because it's a real little gem. And its name comes from its bright, pale yellow rump, which can be quite difficult to see unless it hovers, which fortunately it does very frequently. It's quite a small, dumpy warbler with a very distinctive head pattern, and a good field character is the very dark, bold uh, eye stripe, which broad, bro uh, broadens out behind the eye, curves down and forms a little dark corner to the ear coverts. In the winter, it often forms, it's often a, a part of mixed species flocks in, uh, in the wintering habitat. Now the greenish warbler occurs in the northeast, uh, the northwest Indian foothills and plains, mainly as a common passage migrant uh, between its breeding grounds in the Himalayas and wintering grounds in central, eastern and southern India. It's small, slender, found in wooded habitat. Now the work by Trevor Price on greenish warblers in Andhra Pradesh for me was significant, especially the work he did on winter territorial behaviour. Food is short for greenish warblers in, from December to March and the ter territories varied in quality and this affected um, individuals' behaviour and their survival. All of the wintering birds in his study area held a territory and the Pichu call uh, acted as territorial defence. It was only ever uttered on territory and in intruding birds left as soon as they heard the territory owner giving the call. And what was particularly interesting was Price's understanding of the role of territory holding as resource management in places where there was an absence of other species as food competitors, such as his study area in Andhra Pradesh. Elsewhere, such as the, in the Himalayas, some insectivorous birds like the lemon rump warbler and indeed greenish warblers on passage are more likely to form mixed insectivorous feeding flocks because the cost, the difficulty of defending a territory in such a habitat where there are many other insectivorous species would be too high. And this was actually one of those pieces of research that greatly influenced me on my own work on territorial behaviour and marsh warblers in Zambia. And it became deeply woven into my own love affair with warblers, subliminally bringing in into this love affair an Indian context which would only be consummated many years later. Now this love affair may well have raised eyebrows amongst friends, but it has given me unforgettable encounters and taken me to many magical places. And so for those of you who puzzled about my fascination with warblers all those years ago, I do hope that I've been able to shed a light and you'll never look at a blind reed warbler or a common church chat in the same way again. Thank you.